and that includes conducting public hearings and there are some specific implications for appeal rights depending on whether or not there's been a public hearing. And they're also there to provide uh, independent advice on a range of topics in the planning system uh, which allows them then to comment on strategic direction. So the, the PAC, uh, in talking about themselves, highlights a couple of things that are really important to them. Uh, first being that they see themselves and they have been set up to be, and they take this very seriously, uh, to provide independence, to provide transparency in the system and to provide some certainty in planning and decision making. There are nine full-time commissioners in the PAC and a further nine members who participate as, as needed. Um, most of those uh, commissioners have come from very senior public decision making roles in, in the past. So an important thing about the PAC is that all of these commissioners are appointed by the Minister but once they are members of the PAC, they're not actually under direction from the Minister, so they're able to make independent advice back to government. The sorts of things that are referred to the PAC, um, first of all, um, there are applications where there has been a very high level of community interest, and that is set at 25 uh, objections or submissions at the exhibition stage, where there's been some potential for political influence, where there's a perceived conflict of interest, and where there are complex environmental matters. Now, you might think that that means every approval, but in fact, there are some specific ones that are involved. So what do they do? Well, it's interesting that when they were first established, in the first couple of years, the PAC didn't actually determine that many applications, but um, late 2010, early 2011, their responsibility and delegation was changed by the minister increasing the number of applications that were referred to the PAC and in 2011-2012 in it led to determining 105 state significant development applications. So they're quite busy, I think you would say. Um, some of those were approved, some, some not. Uh, they provided further independent advice on a number of planning matters and conducted technical reviews um, and public hearings, that is public with capital letters really, on two coal mining projects, plus lots and lots of community meetings to hear at first hand the, the views of, of uh, residents and people living around those particular proposal areas so they would be aware of their, uh, of their views. So overall, since 2008, the PAC has looked at 30 coal related projects in New South Wales. So it gives them quite a broad perspective on what's going on in the industry. Now I want to have a look at, as I said, at three examples this afternoon. The first one being Ashton. And I guess the first thing that struck me um, from reading through the, the PAC's comments about Ashton was how long this process had been uh, for everybody involved. So three years from when the EIS for, for Ashton was exhibited to when um, it was finally approved um, late last year. So first of all, our planning and infrastructure had actually recommended approval of Ashton in 2011 um, on the grounds that they believed it was a reasonable extension to an existing mining complex. And it was for a relatively short term extension of, of operations. Um, but they referred it to the application to the PAC for their consideration and the PAC then went through um, a robust process of listening to the community, conducting meetings with a wide range of agency stakeholders and particularly taking on board the views of New South Wales Health. Um, and we'll see this coming through in a number of the PAC hearings that they perhaps um, more conspicuously than others have, have been, had things to say about um, the significance of the views of New South Wales Health in, in the approval system. So in this case, Health had said that they couldn't support this project because they believed that there were existing accumulated impacts involved, particularly at Camberwell, and this in the, in the end became about Camberwell. Um, so the PAC refused the application on, on the grounds that they believed the risks um, outweighed the benefits, and they referred it back to the department for them to have another think about it. Um, the proponent then lodged an appeal in the Land and Environment Court, and the court then put it back 
uh, to the PAC to have another think about it um, and to decide whether they would determine it again or not. So then the PAC went through a, some further consultation. Um, a number of additional studies were done, um, particularly around some cumulative health impacts um, of three mining proposals that are in quite close proximity. Uh, New South Wales Health continued to say that they weren't comfortable with this and that they thought it should not be approved. But in the end, um, based on a number of considerations, the PAC decided that they would approve Ashton subject to conditions which were different to the ones that had been put up by Department of Planning and Infrastructure in their initial assessment. So, what were the things that happened here? So health, we'll just go back to what health um, objections were and how that affected uh, the specific questions that the PAC asked. So health had said that they were very concerned about cumulative impacts and also the existing PM10 uh, concentrations and exceedances at, uh, at Campbell. So the PAC said, well, we, are, we know that this is a difficult um, a difficult issue here. We believe that the, ben the benefits and disbenefits are quite finely balanced. It's not a, a straightforward decision, but there are some quite specific questions that we need to answer about Camberwell. Um, and that is whether this specific project would actually be a source of PM10 that would increase uh, the number of exceedances at Camberwell. And if that was the case, was that a significant number of uh, no, significant impact uh, were there additional things that the, uh, the project, the proponent, could do to remedy that situation? And as a specific issue, uh, reminding, uh, asking the question about, well, whose residences are we talking about here? We see this has come up in a number of their inquiries um, about, is this only about uh, residences which are not owned by the mine, or does it also apply to residences which might be acquired by the mine and subsequently uh, rented out to other people. It's a, an evolving issue. Uh, so finally, I think you'll recognise a, a, a system throwing, flowing through these conditions. So the, the final uh, conditions that the PAC put on Campbell when they approved it. Um, first of all, uh, compliance right up front. So it wasn't about um, just employing best practice, it was that they needed to comply with contemporary air quality um, requirements at all properties outside of the acquisition zone and through that and then providing a lot of additional information to, to the community, real-time monitoring and making sure that the results of that monitoring were available to people, regular reporting of information and of their performance against the, the compliance requirements, um, making sure that people who might be renting properties um, were aware of the risks and the last one there around um, coordinating air quality management, not just within their own site, but particularly in relation to what might be going on with sites around them. Uh, and this comes up again later on in the, in the way that they and the Land and Environment Court have approached some of these issues. So overall, I think there's a couple of important things from Ashton. Um, um, first of all, it's a direct quote from the, from the PAC. Um, they were concerned that the advice that was coming from the state's chief health officer might not have been given sufficient emphasis in some of the other um, hearings and approvals. Um, and interestingly, in relation to those minor residences, even though they had expressed some concerns about how that should be done, 